Hi, everybody. We're going to talk a little bit now about how we're going to apply Darcy's Law for our project. So first, I want to take a look at the grid. So we're going to be representing our aquifer using a grid. It's going to be a 50 by 50 grid. I'm just going to draw a 5 by 5 grid because 50 by 50 would be a little untenable for the whiteboard. Now, each of these grid squares comes with some information. So uh, I'll just use the center grid square to tell you a little bit about that. But the first thing is part of your given information is you have a K value for each grid square. You also have an initial H value for each grid square. Now, what we're going to try to figure out is how the groundwater is moving around this grid. So the way we're going to do that is we want to measure flows into and out of each grid square. And the way we're going to do that is this. We're going to look at flows across each boundary of the grid square. So we're just, for right now, I'm just talking about this center grid square. And we're going to be able to calculate how groundwater flows in and out of each of these boundaries. The only boundaries we're going to be interested in are these four. Uh, that's a simplification that uh, many groundwater models use in order to make it calculatable. Some models also allow for flows across corners like this. We're not actually going to do that for our model. So don't worry about any of that. We're just going to worry about these four flows. Now, each of these flows we're going to calculate using Darcy's Law. So let's start putting together what Darcy's Law looks like. So Darcy's Law, the form we're going to use, looks like this. Q equals negative K times the gradient of H. So Q is the Darcy velocity. This is a flow velocity. Not a volumetric flow rate, but a flow velocity. It's in units of length per time. So for example, centimeters per day or meters per day. We're gonna be working in meters per day for this project. K is the hydraulic conductivity. This is the quantity that controls how fast water can move in the substrate. And then H, or grad H, is the hydraulic head gradient. Now, for this project, we're looking for water level in Matt's well. That's the kind of the final thing we're looking for. So the water level in Matt's well is going to be determined by the hydraulic head. So what we eventually want to be solving for is H. So you're given initial H values, but we need to um, recalculate new H values based on all the information that you're going to be given. So um, that's going to be sort of our unknown quantity. So we'll treat H as our unknowns. Now, let's look at the gradient of H. So grad H. We can express this as a partial differential. So dh dx plus dh dy plus dh dz is the partial derivatives that represent the gradient of h. Now we're only really going to work in two dimensions, so mostly we just care about these two. So we're going to ignore the third dimension and get rid of the dh dz part here. So this gives us a uh, pair of partial derivatives that we can use to calculate our head gradient. Okay, so when we're making this calculation, we're gonna be looking at four different flows. So for the moment, let's just look at one flow. So we want to determine flow across this boundary here. So we'll call this, uh, we'll call this one, we'll call this two. So we wanna determine flow between one and two. So we're gonna calculate Q between one and two. We'll call that, uh, for now, we'll call it Q12. That's going to be equal to negative K times the head gradient between 
those two, the K12 and head gradient 12. So let's make some calculations. Let's talk about K first. So we have a K value in each of these grid squares, but what we need is the K value at the boundary between them. So the standard way to calculate that is as an average of the two K values. Now, um, through experience, uh, groundwater hyd hydrologists have found that the arithmetic mean is not a particularly effective way to determine that K value. So they usually use either the geometric mean or the harmonic mean. So our K value for K12, my apologies, our K value for K12 is going to be equal to, if we do the geometric mean, And that's the one I usually go for. That's going to be the square root of K1 times K2. That gives us the geometric mean. If you wanted to do the harmonic mean instead, you could do that too. So K12 by a harmonic mean would be equal to uh, 1 over I believe it's 2 over one over k1 plus one over k2. Harmonic means a little more complicated. You could still code that in MATLAB and it's no problem. I usually go with the geometric mean. It's the easier one of the two and it provides a good average for this calculation. So that's how we're going to deal with k. Then we need to deal with our head gradient. So our head gradient, grad H, one, two, is gonna be equal to, this is where we're gonna bring out our finite difference approximation. So we're gonna do a forward finite difference approximation here. So we're gonna say that H2 minus H1, that's our, our difference. And then the uh, separation distance is gonna be the distance between the grid cell centers. So I'll show you how we'll calculate that. I'll use two other grid cells so I'm out of the way here, but we're gonna to wanna to measure the distance between this location and this location. So we know the size of these grid cells. We know that this distance here is 10 meters or dx. So we know then that the distance from here to here from the side to the middle is half of dx or five meters. So this here, one half dx. Sorry, I should call it delta x, not dx. When we get to writing this in MATLAB, it's gonna end up being dx, but for now we'll call it delta x. And this is one half of delta x. And so then we also know that this distance in this grid cell is one half of delta x. So the distance from here to here is gonna be one half delta x plus one half delta x, which equals delta x. Kind of a long winded way of explaining something you could probably figure out intuitively, but that's our separation distance between our two values. So that's gonna be our denominator here in our finite difference formula. So now we've got our, our, uh, our gradient and we've got our K value. So we plug all that back together. We're gonna end up with Q12 equals negative square root of K1 times K2 multiplied by H2 minus H1 divided by delta X. So that's one of our flows. And that's how we're gonna determine our gradient in one particular direction. So let's put this together for all the flows into one particular grid square now. So we have this form of the partial derivatives 
for the gradient of h. We can write that out in a different form. So this is for this is a two-dimensional form. I'm going to write it out in something that's still two dimensions, but in this case, it's going to be four directions. So in this case, we have dh. Uh, dh dx down. So I'll call it dhd for dh down dx. I'm sorry, that should be dh down dy. Plus dh left dx plus dh right dx and plus dh up dy. So we're still in two dimensions. We have an x dimension and a y dimension, but in this case, we're looking at it in four different directions. So if we look at, our, at just any individual grid square in our grid, we have a single grid square. We're gonna be dealing with flows into and out of the adjacent grid squares. So we've got this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. Now the order I usually like to look at these in is this order like this. So we have one, two, three, and four. The reason I go in this order will become more clear a little later when we get into a lot of the details of solving this as a uh, linear equation. So now we need to determine four flows into and out of our center grid square. So the grid square we're gonna be interested in is this one here. And we wanna determine how much water flows in, how much water flows out. So here's how we're gonna do that. We're gonna start with the first one, Q1. So this is the flow into and out of this center grid square from grid square one. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take our Hydraulic conductivities, so that's going to be uh, K0, that's our grid square in the middle, multiplied by K1. And then we're going to take just the partial, de de uh, partial derivative for the downward direction. So that's going to be H1 minus H0, that's our home H, divided by delta Y. That's the distance between them. That's the first flow. So we have K grad H. Now we'll do the second flow. This is flow from to or from the square mark two into our center grid square. So we have K zero times K two multiplied by H two minus H zero divided by delta X. So it's delta Y if it's up and down, delta X if it's left and right. Q three. Same idea, K0 times K3, in this case, H3 minus H0 divided by delta X. So we're in the X direction. Then the fourth one, Q4 is equal to our K0 times K4, H4 minus H0 divided by delta Y. So now we have four equations, one for flow, each of these flows. So if we want to determine how much water flows into and out of this center grid square, we can do that by taking the sum of these four flows. So our Q total is going to be equal to Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4. Now at this point, we need to add a, one more feature here, and that's a source sink term. So these four equations that we came up with here are just determining flow from these adjacent grid squares. It's possible that water could be flowing in or out through other means. So the main one that we're gonna look at is by way of wells. So wells are gonna remove water 
from a, in a different way than either any of these four cues that we've come up with. So we need to include that as well. So we'll include that here as our source sync term. I usually call that uh, Q I O divided by A. So Q I O is gonna be input output of water. So this is water that's either added through uh, rainfall or infiltration or water that's removed by way of um, by way of a well pumping it out. So generally, this quantity is going to be positive if water in, negative if water out. Okay. So our Q total is the sum of all five of these terms. Now, this problem is a steady state problem. So what that means is the, while water is flowing across these boundaries, it's a steady state problem. And that means that in the end, the overall change is zero. So the way we can describe steady state is this. We could say Q in plus Q out equals zero. Now, we don't actually know if Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, or QIO over A is gonna be an input or an output. But we have this convention where inputs are positive and outputs are negative. So if it's, so the number, by, by using this equa these equations, the number will work out to be positive for an input or negative for an output. So we don't really even need to worry about any of that, except when we're putting in our wells. So. If we sum all of these, some of these are ins, some of these are outs, but the total sum of all of these flows is gonna be zero. So because this is a steady state problem, we have the advantage that we can set this whole thing equal to zero, which is very convenient. <laughs>